All right, unit two, how AI works. In this unit, we're gonna understand what generative AI really is and some of its strengths and historic limitations. And I say historic because all of this is improving at such a rapid rate. So most software in the past has been manually coded and built by human developers. And what that means is humans are writing specific rules for the computer to follow. And the human developer is usually following a pretty basic workflow. They're defining a problem and requirements. They're then designing a solution for that problem. They're writing codes with rules and instructions for the computer to follow. Then they're testing, fixing errors, and optimizing performance. And while some of that engineering is being done to build AI itself, the way that AI and machine learning works is fundamentally very different. In machine learning, the computer is the one finding patterns in data, and it's creating its own rules to follow. Machine learning is very data intensive. So here, humans are collecting and preparing data, training the model on all these examples, and then observing what the capabilities of the model are. So a lot of what they're doing is testing and evaluating the performance of these different AI models. There's three main ways that AI systems learn. The first is through supervised learning, where the AI is trained with labeled data. Let's say you wanted to train a model to detect real emails from spam emails. You would give the AI a set of millions and millions of example emails and tell it exactly which ones are spam and which ones are real. Over time, it would detect patterns in the spam emails and get really good at detecting if a new email that it's never seen before is spam or not. The next is unsupervised learning, where the AI is finding patterns in unlabeled data. Let's say you're Amazon and you have millions and millions of shoppers visit your website every day. There's a lot of different data points you know about shoppers, and they don't neatly fall into clear categories. So you might have AI group customers together with similar shopping habits to show them similar recommendations of products that they might be interested in. And finally, we have reinforcement learning, where AI is given rewards and penalties based on its performance. Let's say you wanted to make a really great chess engine. Well, you might reward that AI every time it makes a really good move and every time it wins a game, but you might penalize it every time it blunders or loses a game. Over time, it would get really good at playing chess. So let's dive more into large language models, which we covered in unit one. Large language models can actually read text, but the way they do that is they split text up into millions and millions of tokens. And this is what that looks like. The AI is actually seeing a single token at a time. So you can see it's breaking up this paragraph into words or subwords and seeing each piece independently. Over time, the AI is fitting these tokens into its context window, which you can think of as its short-term memory. In applications like ChatGPT, the AI is remembering the last certain number of tokens in that conversation. So maybe it's remembering the last few messages depending on how long your conversation is getting. Over time, if you have a really long conversation, it starts to forget the earlier messages. And finally, here's how a large language model actually generates text. In this sentence, we see the cat is chasing the, based on all of its training data, the AI is now predicting the next most likely word. And here it's mouse. So just by guessing the next word or the next token, the AI can give really impressive results. So putting all these pieces together, here's how ChatGPT and similar tools work. First, they're trained from lots and lots of data, mainly text data from the internet, books, and different articles. Based on that data, the large language model is learning patterns and relationships between different words and concepts, like cat and mouse. Thanks to a transformer architecture, the AI is able to understand context and relationships, and then it can predict the next tokens or words based on your prompt. So what is AI really good at? Well, first of all, pattern recognition. It's used to finding trends in huge data sets. Next is processing speed. It can analyze information much faster than humans. If you've ever uploaded like a massive PDF into ChatGPT and ask it a question, you might be impressed by how quickly it gets a result back to you. Third is consistency. Unlike a human being, AI never gets tired and it can scale to work 24 seven across multiple systems at once. This enables AI to handle a lot of complexity and start to personalize your experience because it's remembering aspects of your previous conversations with it. Now let's talk about the limitations of AI. They can hallucinate at times, meaning they can generate false information confidently. AI is also prone to bias because it can reflect and amplify biases in the training data, let's say from the internet that it's been provided with. That said, companies like Anthropic and OpenAI 
do a lot of great work to combat this. So we consider their models to be generally safe. And jumping ahead to number five, the black box problem. It's difficult to understand exactly why AI makes certain decisions. That said, it's not all doom and gloom. Like I mentioned in the introduction, AI is improving incredibly fast. For example, there's way fewer hallucinations in AI tools today versus two to three years ago. This is because many AI tools can actually go search information from the web to make sure it's giving you a cited answer. Additionally, for subjects like math, tools like Flint actually have the AI go out and use a calculator to make sure that's giving you accurate responses. And you can imagine that's much better than having the AI try to think of the answer in its own head. And finally, the need to write really complex, in-depth prompts is slowly starting to fade as some AI tools like Flint have the AI write prompts for the AI to follow. It turns out that AI is really good at prompt engineering. With that, let's jump into unit three. 